years after Christ was crucified, the holiest site in Christendom was seized and defiled. The Pope beseeched all Christians to unite in a great crusade. Go forward boldly as knights of Christ, hurrying swiftly to defend the church. His call was heeded by a new order of knights who pledged their lives to retake the Holy Land. Warrior monks fighting for God and betrayed in the end by their own church. In 1189, the Holy Land is a battleground. Two armies, Christian and Muslim, each fight with God on their side. At the place of honor in the Christian lines, Gérard de Rifort commands Allah's worthiest foe, the Knights Templar. These men, brave and rigorous in arms, have struck hard with frequent attacks, both secretly and openly, so that those who previously terrorized us now regard themselves as most happy if they are permitted to live in peace. So terrible are the Templars that the great Muslim general Salahadin, as generous as he is shrewd, has shown them no mercy. The fiery heart of the enemy, he calls the Templars. These, more than all the others, destroy the Arab religion and slaughter us. With fire in his heart, Gérard de Rifort prepares to lead his knights once more into battle. Seventy years before, the Templars this scourge of God was only eight men strong. On the road to Jerusalem, two French nobles saw the light. Hugh de Payon and Godfrey de Saint-Omer, traveling with six other knights, vowed to safeguard the progress of pilgrims to the Holy Land. Reaching Jerusalem, retaken from the Muslims, they hurried to the Holy Sepulchre, the very site, as all good Christians knew, where their Savior was crucified. There, as all good pilgrims did, they etched a cross in its stones. The Christian king of Jerusalem was so impressed by their piety that he granted them quarters in his own palace, itself built, it was said, on the site of the Temple of Solomon. The band of brothers came to be called the Poor Knights of the Temple of Solomon, the Templars. They took a vow of poverty and took as their seal the image of two knights sharing a horse. Nurtured by the Pope himself, the new order flourished. To buy their own salvation, noblemen gave the Templars armor, horses, and land.
At bases throughout Europe, the knights enlarged their ranks and trained for battle. Soon, from their own storehouses and monasteries, the Templars were sending supplies and men to the Holy Land, the sons of nobles who had spent their youth preparing for war. Among them, a young Flemish knight, Gerard de Rifort. Gerard had gone to Jerusalem to claim his fortune, a rich bride. Before he arrived, his betrothed was sold to another man. Gerard now wed his fate to the Templars. Other knights hired themselves out as freelances. Other knights defiled themselves with wealth, pillage, rape. As a Templar, Gerard donned the white tunic of poverty, humility, and chastity. In a ceremony both secret and sacred, Gerard committed himself to God. You seek what is a great thing, but you see us from the outside. You cannot know the austerities of the order. For when you wish to be on this side of the sea, you will be sent to the other side. And if you want to sleep, you will be awoken. And if you wish to eat, you must go hungry. Now, decide, good gentle brother, if you could tolerate all these hardships. From this day, his life would be ruled by two books, the Holy Bible and the Templar Manual. Too much talk is not without sin. We altogether prohibit idle words and wicked outbursts of laughter. No brother should swear when angry or calm, nor should he ever say an ugly or vile word. Unlike other knights, the Templars cut their hair short and grew beards. And unlike other knights, they vowed absolute chastity, a vow reinforced by their pledge never to bathe or to change their sheepskin drawers. None of you may presume to kiss a woman, be it widow, young girl, mother, sister, aunt, or any other. The knighthood should avoid at all costs the embraces of women, by which men have perished many times. To guard the route to the Holy Land, the Templars built a chain of forts These whitewashed outposts gleamed like beacons. Inside, they were as austere as the knights themselves. In 1177, near the Mediterranean port of Ascalon, the Templars attacked a Muslim army under the Sultan of Egypt, the great Muslim general Salahaddin. The knights won the battle but the Muslims captured their Grand Master. The Templars' rules forbade ransom. In battle, the only honor lay in victory or death. Their leader perished. Gerard de Rifort, who had risen fast through the ranks, was appointed the new Grand Master. In 1189, he would lead the Templars at Acre, once more against Salahaddin.
Acre, the largest port in Palestine, as desirable as it was formidable. This town is good and strong, bounded and fortified by the sea, and protected by good, large, deep moats lined with stonework from the bottom. The towers are high and most powerful. Besieging Acre, the Crusaders were themselves besieged by Salah Adin, coming to its relief. On a crisp morning in October, an order passed through their camp. Gérard de Rifour made ready for battle. He first donned a quilted jacket to pad his torso, then 20 pounds of mail made of thousands of interlocking ringlets, small enough to deflect an arrow. Over his armor, a surcoat to protect the metal from rain, sand, and the Mediterranean sun. Then a hood of mail to guard his neck. And last, his iron helmet. You could see there an incomprehensible number of armed men. There were so many shining coats of mail, so many glittering helmets, so many noble horses neighing, so many white mantles, so many knights of great probity and daring, so many banners that never had such a crowd appeared to be reckoned up. The Templars rallied by their Grand Master and their banner, black and white, a reminder of the battle between good and evil they were called to fight. Its motto stiffened their resolve, not for ourselves, but for God. Gerard led his Templars in prayer with the Psalm of David. Not unto us, O Lord, not for ourselves, but for God. The two enemies were as unlike in warfare as they were in faith. The Crusader knights fought at close quarters, hand to hand and heavily armed. The Templars fought as a formation. Their discipline was scorned by their comrades, but respected by their foe. Their first attack is the most terrible. In going, they are the first. In returning, the last. Lightly armed and cool-headed, the Muslim horsemen struck like hornets and fled just as fast. Unlike the Crusaders, they felt no shame in fighting at arm's length, nor in living to fight another day. The Pope would hear how his knights fought that day. On the 4th of October, we joined battle. Altogether, we were 4,000 knights and 100,000 foot soldiers. However, our enemy Saladin had a 100,000 knights. Nevertheless, we were armed with the sign of the Holy Cross. The Templars charged. They held their lances low to pierce Arab armor. Coming to blows, they lashed out with their swords. Those who fell to the ground fought on with sword or axe. Victory or death or disgrace. Should any of them, for any reason, turn his back to the enemy or come forth alive from a defeat or bear arms against the Christians, he is severely punished. The white mantle with the red cross, which is the sign of his knighthood, is taken away, and he is cast from the society of his brethren and eats his food on the floor for the space of a year. No knights 
were disgraced this day. In their eyes, God fought with them. Allah abandoned his followers, and his followers abandoned the field. They fled before our swords, and we pursued them up to their very tents. We managed to kill 500 of Saladin's knights, far more than we had hoped. While we were engaged in battle with Saladin, 5,000 knights left the city and made a sudden attack on us. We still managed to hold up against Saladin on one side and offer courageous resistance on the other before retreating to our camp. But for God, our men were killed on that day. Among them, their grand master, Gerard de Rifort. The siege went on. Among the crusaders, food was scarce, disease rife. Christians died or deserted, but the Templars stayed. It was beneath knights to do such menial work as breaking down walls. Instead, they undermined Acre with money. With Templar gold, the Crusaders bought siege machines. Led by the English king, Richard the Lionheart, the Christians spent the summer of 1190 trying to breach Acre. They filled in the moat and brought up battering rams. They wheeled a siege tower toward the defenders, but the walls were too strong. After two years of holding out, the city was defeated by starvation. In July of 1191, Acre yielded. A month later, ignoring the Templars' advice, Richard pushed on to Jerusalem and was beaten. For another century, holy warriors battled each other for the Holy Land. Across the sands of Palestine, Christian armies, multitudes up to a hundred thousand strong, flowed and ebbed. Between the tides of invasion, the Templars held fast in their fortresses. No other knights knew the land or the enemy so well. As warriors and diplomats, the Templars kept the Muslims at bay. In 1291, a hundred years after the fall of Acre, the Templars were again fighting for the city, from inside. Unlike the defenders before them, they refused to surrender. Like them, they perished. The Templar Code forbade the expense of burying a knight. Instead, his body should be thrown to the dogs. At Acre, the dogs ate well. With Acre went the Holy Land. After two centuries, the ordeal of driving a people from their own soil proved too great. 20,000 Templars were left in the land they fought for. Their souls already departed. As an order, the Templars survived and thrived. While in Palestine, they had become skilled not only as warriors and diplomats, 
but as merchants. So rich had they grown that the Templars, sworn to poverty, were now bankers to Europe. Their power rivaled kingdoms. Now the very church for which they once fought so bravely turned on them. Philip IV, King of France, feared their power and coveted their wealth. With the Pope, he plotted their ruin. They're so outrageously proud that one can hardly look them in the face. Tell me why the Pope permits them to misuse the riches which are offered them in God's service. It is a pity, in my view, that we do not rid ourselves of them for good. In October of 1307, on the unfortunate morning of Friday the 13th, the Templars of France were rounded up. They were tortured until they confessed. Their crime, heresy. They were burned at the stake, and the proud order of the Templars went up in smoke. The Christian church had once condemned war until Christian soldiers fought for God. From the ashes of the Templars, this ember would smolder. The idea of a holy war a crusade, a time when God takes sides. In 1314, Jacques de Molay, the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar, was burned at the stake. Legend says he cursed the Pope and the King. Next year, he swore, I shall bring you to stand judgment before the Almighty. Within a month, the Pope was dead. Seven months later, the King of France fell from his horse while hunting and died. Perhaps God had chosen sides. Thank you.